I was going to talk about spiritual ecology, but something happened to me about a month ago, which has completely changed me. And so I'll talk a little bit about how I got to where I am, and then I will try to speak about a process that I am now in, which has changed and is changing me dramatically. So here we are. In a row. In Shoreditch. <laughs> in London. In England. Not quite in Europe. <laughs> On this planet, in this solar system, in the vast mystery of the universe, now, now, it's happening now, now. I got up this morning. It is my path to walk up a hill. I live in a tiny village in Sussex. And I walk up onto a hill called Thirlbeacon. And I do this just about every morning that I am there. However much wine and however much bullshit I've spoken the night before. <laughs> I get up. I put on my boots and I walk up this hill. And every day, every day is profoundly, profoundly different in its detail, in what it gives. And this morning, parallel sun coming through copper leaves scattered on a red path, and then up the steep escarpment, through thistles and nettles, up onto the top, massive view to the north of the North Weald, to the south, the sea, silver, to the east, eastward. And to the west, the endless land. But this morning, there was a dark cloud coming in and that light was compressed. And it lit everything in a manner in which I had never seen it before. And so I stopped and I looked at it. And I had, no I had walked this walk 4,000, 5,000 times. And yet I had never seen this before on planet Earth. The warm flesh of the forest speaks, formed and spun from sleep. Did you not know you emerged from broken stones Contaminated, sent with words, healed the dead grief into the ground. See, he will break every door to find you, bringing thistles for your feast, parched grass to quench your thirst. These are the crumbs of splendor. The state of nature, constantly given, constantly laid out before us. When we walk into pristine wilderness, we are walking into the reality of immaculate conception, and as our grandfathers and grandmothers knew, into the dreaming. Have you ever been in pristine wilderness? You will know. It will speak. You will feel it. 
I thought there was no pristine wilderness left in this country. And this summer, I've stumbled into a little parcel in the middle of Dartmoor. A river. Butterflies everywhere. Cormorants flying in from the sea to fish. Swimming in this clear water. Just a tiny little fraction of land. And it does something to us. To be in that presence where the earth begins to speak through us. Every hair on your head, every thread on every feather, the fierce teeth of the fox, the stamen, the petal, the rendered hills, the deep, the silence, the desire of the storm. Immaculate conception didn't happen once. It is happening all the time. One of the greatest tragedies of our age is the rise of an empirical dictatorship that decrees nothing can be known of itself unless it is quantifiable, unless it is measurable. How many cells, how many feathers? This action causes this reaction, that we can know it by studying its behavior, unpicking its muscles. Can we know this room by counting the chairs? In his recent book, Robert McFarlane writes, only that by instrumentalizing nature, linguistically and operationally, we have largely stunned the earth out of wonder. Yes, we can measure sea level rise. We can count how many bee orchids remain. We can count how many species have become extinct over the last years. We can even decide which ones we are to save. That is apparently a choice that lies before each one of us now. This way of living, this way of being human, of interacting has meant that the fundamental and basic relationship of each one of us to the very ground we stand on is broken. We all know this. We're here because we feel it. And more tragic still, is that this way of being, we are told, is progress. The reality of global warming, the tragic narrative of species extinction, of soil depletion, happens within the narrative of human progress. This is progress? Let's just look at the word conservation, and with it the words nature reserve. What's going on here? We, the all-powerful empirical beings, will generously conserve this piece of land and all that lives on it, will we? We will set aside a small piece of land that will become a nature reserve where animals, birds and plants to live on the reservation. We might even put barbed wire around it, and we will use these places in the future to educate the public about the wildlife that lives here. That in the future we'll only ever be able to live there. Is this a system we want to carry forward? This is what the RSPB do. They do good work. The National Trust, we're conserving. Conserve. What 
a week serving. And why are we having to do it? Does anyone really believe that delivering aid to refugees would stop the war? It is one song that sings the wave to the shore and the flies cascade in an alley lined with light, taking the mercy of rain and air. In land, the air swills spring, afraid at first, hardly daring to live. The leaves creep into the wind, and the fields are white with rain. Reason is no cure for madness. In which book do we write the blossom that in time triffled stubborn stones will melt as the prophecies of physics burn the stems and butterflies, the dancing oaks and shapes of shells? The temple is made of leaves. Do not bind it with stories. I'm also, I was also struggling with the word sustainability. Oh, don't worry, we can eat what we like. It's been farmed sustainably, it's been reared sustainably. Who decides what's sustainable? The great us. The great us. We decide, unless we are bold enough to talk to the sparrows. I understand that the word reflects the need for balance and from that harmony, but it is pale. It is pale. We have never lived in peace with the earth. It's all very well to romanticize our brothers and sisters living, daring to live far closer to the land and we do that. There have been bad times as well. Anyone who has read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, this is our story now. We are overspending. What is happening here on this beautiful planet resonates out into the universe. Right now, this planet is in pain. We are in pain. Don't be afraid of naming it, of knowing it. Don't be afraid. And don't be afraid of feeling it. Now she speaks in tongues of leaves, sending flies and owls out onto the roads. Nothing is imagined. Did you kneel when the grasses raised from mud began to speak with rain in the houses walled with dust and light, holding glimpses of fields? Did you kneel heavy with wine at the gate of the night as she let slip her flames and let your horses run. Did you welcome the autumn today as she routed the trees and set the tomb of winter deceiving you with hope? And now this this isn't real. We are not involved in rescuing the planet. We are rescuing ourselves. Audrey Geraldine Lord wrote, you cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. So all we know the trajectory that we're on, lobbying, public relations, whatever it might be, the 
the last 40, 50 years. It's not working. We need now to think and feel very differently about being a human being. This is, as Martin has said, this is a tragedy, but from it, we can only emerge from it. We cannot go forward with the current narrative. Being human. Look at this. We are separate. Individuality. You, me. What has it done to us? What has it done to us? The cult of the individual. The greatest illusion, the greatest of damage is being done by buying into, buying into the illusion of the individual. Okay, I'm going to ask you to take one more breath, very deep breath. I put it to you now that it is not possible for any of us to have done that, to have been here, without the rest of life. We are not separate. We are utterly beautifully interdependent. We cannot take one breath, the fragility of one breath, without the oxygen that is being produced. By the trees, by the grass, we cannot exist without that without that one simple gift. They cannot exist without us exhaling oxygen, carbon dioxide, sorry. The earth cannot exist and spin in space, isolated from the forces around it. Men are not separate from women, women are not separate from men, we are utterly interdependent. The past, the present, the future are utterly interdependent. We inhabit an interdependent state. We are not these kings. We are not these queens. We do not have one breath without the reality of existent life in all its other forms. What happens if you take interdependence into the realm of politics? What happens if you take interdependence into the workplace, into the market? What happens if you take interdependence into agriculture? How would we be? What would be our song?
When we act from a place of separateness, which is what we have been doing, we break the covenant with the rest of life. And that is what we now see unfolding before us. When we act as utterly separate beings, separated beings, we break the covenant with the rest of life that sustains our very being. As Martin has said, there is not one story that is going to rescue us. There are going to be many. But it is now my firm conviction that we should do nothing except from a place of interdependence. To grow our food, our relationships, our science, another spark to take home with you. Thank you.